Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. This week, we're bringing you one of our bonus episodes where we're going to talk about some work from home advice, some tips and tricks. When I worked at Microsoft and Adam used to work there, we both worked from home. And I know that you have some opinions on what it's been like pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic. What tips do you have or what have you noticed that there's some differences between when we used to work from home pre-pandemic to what we're doing now post-pandemic? I think that's a good framing for this conversation. So when the pandemic first started, every person came out of the woodwork telling people how to work from home. And now we're many, many months in, and I think a lot of people have learned on the job. But I think the perspective you and I can bring that's unique is that we did it before the pandemic. So we've been able to watch, like, what are people doing? What lessons have they learned that we already knew? What lessons are they still struggling to learn? And that's what I think we really want to bring to today's episode where we have a bit of a unique take. And, you know, the very first thing I would start off with is do not do video shaming. Video meetings are not equivalent to in-person meetings. There is more than enough evidence to show that the cognitive load of doing a video meeting is significantly higher than an audio meeting and in no way lights up the same part of the brain as being in person. So stop. If somebody doesn't want to turn on their video, they don't have to. Don't shame them. Don't try to talk them into it. Do not, for any reason, set a company policy that requires it. Microsoft has worked from home for the field for years and years and years, and we do audio calls. We do not turn on video for internal calls. We started to for a little bit in the early part of the pandemic, and then it's already kind of petered out. We are back to audio only all of the time. And so basically what I do is I never turn on video unless I'm on a call with a customer and they turn it on. And then I will. I have a ring light. I have a 4K webcam, so I'm happy to turn it on. And that's fine. But let's stop making this false equivalence that video is the same as in person because it's not. It's not the same because whether you're staring into your webcam, that's not like looking somebody in the eyes, or you're staring at their video feed while you're trying to look presentable on your video feed, that is also not equivalent. So that's kind of my first soapbox statement I want to make as we have this conversation is I hear of companies that require everybody to be on video, that's gross, or people doing video shaming, and I am not here for it. And if you were using that as a crutch to you know, make sure people are paying attention or something, that's not how you do work from home. Andy, what do you think about that? I think that's a great point because my company had a very in-person culture. And so when the pandemic first started, video was not mandatory, but was highly encouraged. And now it's about 50%. For my team meetings, we'll turn on video because for the most part, it's not like a formalized project meeting or let's get stuff done. It's kind of a check-in to see how everyone's doing, kind of going through our day or our week. There's some business that's being conducted, but it's mostly just a check-in, kind of almost like a social meeting. And so we'll turn on our video so that everyone's hanging out and it's much more casual. For our project meetings, they're about half. Sometimes if someone turns on their video, I'll turn on mine. If they leave them off, then I leave mine off. That's perfect. And and again, you shouldn't even feel obligated to do it. If you want to, that's great. But don't give in to peer pressure and do it just because somebody else is. And I think where we go next from here is to talk about scheduling a little bit. And I have thoughts on this for sure. So number one, Microsoft has research that shows that people are working on average an additional two hours a day, two hours a day compared to what they were doing pre-pandemic. So that's two hours additional of productivity. Now that is not going to come without a cost. So if you're a manager and you're rubbing your hands together with glee because you are getting so much additional productivity out of your people, maybe step back a second because that's going to lead to burnout. And where's that time coming from? That's coming from casual drop eyes in people's cubes. That's coming from water cooler conversations. That's coming from lunch breaks. That's coming from commutes. And all of those things we know contribute to making people more productive when they're on. And so you need to take this back. You need to set boundaries. When do you start work for the day? There should be a time. My workday begins at X time. And more importantly, when does your workday end? 
you need to clarify that as well. And you should not be pushed into accepting meetings that bleed into those times. I will not do it. I do not start working till 8 a.m. Somebody tried to schedule me for 7.30 and I said, I'm not available. And it's just as simple as that. If you stand up for yourself, nobody's going to go to your manager over that. I mean, at least unless you have a really toxic culture. So respect that. The other thing I really encourage is schedule a lunch break. Take time to step away. Go spend time with your family. If you have somebody at home who is maybe helping take care of children or prepare meals, this gives them a constant time to shoot for. So I take lunch 1130 to 1230 every day. And that gives certainty to when I will be available for lunch. So I recommend that too. And Andy, I think you have a couple of thoughts on kind of how to schedule meetings or back-to-backs or breaks. What are what are some of your thoughts on this? So for me, because I do project-oriented work as well as incident response and remediation, my workflow isn't as set. So sometimes I have meetings, sometimes I I'm responding to things that are critical, and that can be any time of the day. My expectation is that I could get pinged at 8 o'clock at night for something critical that's happening. So that can equate to a lot of people who are on call for different things. And so my workflow, the way that I try to break things up is I take small breaks throughout the day. I try to schedule meetings that are 50 minutes instead of an hour or 25 minutes instead of 30 minutes because that extra five minutes or 10 minutes gives me time to stretch my legs or take a bio break or just catch up on something in between a meeting instead of clicking leave on one meeting and joining another. Because in the real world, when you're going from one meeting to another, there's transit time. Even if you're scheduling a back-to-back meeting, unless you're meeting in the same room, there's time where you're walking from one meeting to another. And think about that interaction when you get to that room. If you're like, oh, I just got done with another meeting. Let me go grab a cup of coffee. That person's not going to think twice generally. But for some reason, when it's digital and you click leave and you click join, the, the expectation is that you're there and ready to go. And so I think as humans, we kind of want to appease that the other folks in the meeting so that we're there and attentive, but we haven't had a break. And so I recommend scheduling 50 minute meetings and 25 minute meetings versus the 30 and, and 60. And you can actually do this with an outlook in the settings. There is a feature where you can automatically set when you're scheduling it an hour, it'll automatically schedule a 50 minute meeting or whatever you designate. It could be 55 minutes. And so that when the meeting is created, it's automatic that it's going to be a 50 minute or 25 minute. Go turn that setting on. It's really helpful. And it kind of leads me to plug one of my favorite books. And this book is 10 years old, but it could not be more relevant today. It's a book called Rework. So R-E-W-O-R-K. And we'll put a link in the show notes. It's written by David Hannemeyer Hansen and Jason Freed. They're the founders of Basecamp. And this is a whole book kind of turning traditional business convention on its head. And I love it. I think it came out in like 2010, but again, could not be more relevant today. Anyhow, one of the things they talk about is meetings should be exactly as long as they need to be. If a meeting is 37 minutes, then that's how long the meeting should be. Oftentimes, meetings are like liquids. They will expand to fill whatever container they're in. And in general, be really, really hardcore about scheduling the meeting to not be any longer than it has to. Because if you give an hour, people will fill the time and make it an hour. So I do this all the time as I'll say, well, what are we talking about? What's the agenda? And I'll I'll schedule it for 40 minutes. I'll schedule it for 45. I'll schedule it for 35, whatever the proper length of time to have that conversation is. And you know what? If you don't get through it, life goes on. So definitely give yourself those gaps and those breaks. That outlook setting is a super easy way to do it. But whatever you can do, absolutely don't give yourself back to backs without a chance to grab a drink, stretch your legs, go to the restroom. Super super, super important. Whenever I've had like back to back to back and I've never had it worse than I'd say three, it gets really awful (laughs) by that third meeting just because I haven't had a moment to reset mentally. It's super important. I'd even say if you schedule an hour and you get through your agenda in 40 minutes, don't be afraid to just end the meeting there. Mm -hmm. I often will have weekly meetings where the time is already set, but if there's nothing to talk about or we get through everything in 15 minutes, great. End the meeting. Don't waste anybody else's time by filling that time with other things to talk about. As long as we're together, let's talk about this. Yeah, don't do that. Do not. Right now in this time, that's not the time to, to do the as long as we're together kind of thing. 
And when you're in the meetings, people are often multitasking during the meeting, and that's expected. You should also not shame anyone for not paying attention because we're all busy and we're all trying to get things done, especially in IT. Things will pop up. Incidents will happen. I get pinged all the time during meetings. And so it's expected that you're maybe not paying attention. And when someone asks a question, which I'm sure has happened to you in a meeting before, they'll ask a question and they'll be like, well, what do you think, Adam? And you totally missed the question because you weren't paying attention, but you heard your name. Mm -hmm. So one of the tips that was given out in one of our group chats was say the person's name before you ask the question so that they pay attention right there. Then you ask the question, right? So Adam, what do you think about this or you know, what's your opinion on this? So that way you're triggering that attention and then you're asking the question rather than embarrassing them because they weren't paying attention. Treat them like a digital assistant, like how you say your wake word for your Amazon Echo or your lady in your iPhone or the Google Assistant. You know, same idea here. I mean, we're not trying to treat people like machines, but the human mind works in a lot the same way. It will wake up when it hears your name and then it will start processing what happens after that. So this is a great way to help everyone be more successful. This is such a good tip. I love this is... Andy, we're thinking about deploying this tool to the endpoints. Do you have any heartburn about doing that? You should be able to respond to that really effectively because I said your name first and then I gave you the full context of what I was asking you. That's the way to go about it. It's going to make your meetings flow faster and better. So huge tip. Love it. And as Adam said, you know, people are working harder and more often during the pandemic than they probably ever have while they're in a physical office due to all those different factors of commuting and water cooler breaks. I would say don't feel guilty about taking a break. If you're not scheduled for a meeting, take that time to step away because there's most likely nothing that you're going to do in that break that's going to be critical that has to be done right then and there. You can take 30 minutes to go for a walk. Or for me, sometimes I'll have a two hour break in between in the day where I don't have any meetings scheduled. I'll take that time to sit down and watch a Netflix show and chill while I eat my lunch. And I don't feel guilty about it because I know that that time will be made up later on that night. Or if it's not made up later on that night, it'll be made up the next day you know, where I'm back to back meetings or something else will come up. So don't think that you have to work an eight hour day or even eight hours in the entire day, because on average at most companies pre pandemic in an eight hour period, most people are only productive for about four hours, maybe even less. Because the other time you're getting up and getting coffee, going to the bathroom, eating lunch, browsing Facebook, watching YouTube, then doing some work, chatting with your coworkers. And so there's all this time that's in between that you're physically there. So you think you're working in your mind, but you're just doing other things. And that doesn't happen at home because you don't have that. And so my recommendation is take those breaks. Don't feel guilty about them because I guarantee you that time will be made up somewhere else. Yeah, that stat for Microsoft, two additional hours a day. Your company is getting 10 hours additional productivity per person per week. That's insane. If your company is not very aware of this problem and is not actively taking steps to address it, that's too bad because they should be. Every single company right now is having an impending crisis with their people overworking themselves. And this is where you need to be conscientious and build great rapport with your manager about how you address it. And so Andy's tips are spot on. Do not feel guilty about stepping away. Work is not a linear thing. You do not do eight hours straight through. That is a complete myth. And I think your estimates of what people accomplish in the office is spot on. Your company is getting plenty of productivity from you. It is okay to keep your mental state and your mental health and your physical health in balance too. And kind of even along with that, setting expectations with your team and your manager. You know, if you work late one night, then start the next day later. That should be fine. And this is hard to address if you're an individual contributor, but I have heard of companies where people are sitting there watching people's status on Teams or Skype or 
or whatever you use at your company for I am in presence. Do not do that. That is gross. Measure work output. Do not measure time sitting in the chair. That is not any measure of productivity anywhere. So don't fall into that trap. And if that is culturally happening at your company, find ways that you can address that with the people immediately surrounding you. You might not be able to change the whole company, but hopefully you can change your team's mindset because managing or measuring how often your bubble is green is bogus and you should not do it. Is somebody doing their job? That's all that matters. If they're green, red, yellow throughout the day and that changes, that is perfectly fine if their work is getting done. So don't do that. Remote work is not analogous to sitting your butt in your seat all day in your office chair. So don't think about it that way. I think one of the biggest takeaways for me is being able to communicate what you're doing and setting those expectations with your boss. So having that time to go over what his expectations are when you say, are they getting their work done? Well, this is what I've been doing with my time. I think one of the, to borrow a term from you, Adam, the grossest practices out there is making people time themselves on what they've been doing throughout the day. I've heard that happen before where, you know, I've spent from 8 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. answering emails, from 8.30 to 9 a.m. working on this project. I took a 10-minute break here, and now I'm working, you know, and I have to, like, list all this out. I've heard of managers doing that. That is a terrible practice. And if I had a manager who made me do that, I'd quit because that is not a way to manage someone's time. You should set specific work goals, specific projects, specific milestones. And as an individual contributor, you need to be able to articulate what you've been doing with that time and how you've met those goals. Absolutely. And, you know, this all comes back to, again, I know we said this at the top of the show, but just reminding everyone, this is from experience working for companies with mature work from home cultures, where it is long established and well established. And so where some of this advice is coming from, I know it sounds really strongly worded, but again, companies that have strong culture, they do things like this. So I work for Microsoft, as has been often mentioned, nobody, and I mean nobody, watches what color your bubble is. Nobody goes to somebody's manager and says, so-and-so was only green for three hours today. Nobody goes and guilt someone over blocking their calendar for lunch or setting a start and end time for their work day. None of those things happen in good work from home culture. So that's why we're being so prescriptive about this is because we've seen what works right and what doesn't. When I worked at Microsoft and now, you know, I block my schedule off every morning and afternoon when I need to go pick up my kids. I'm just out of the office and that is weekly. And my coworkers know that, my boss knows that. And so if someone tries to schedule a meeting during that time, I'm not available. You know, sometimes I'll try and take it from the car if it's not something that I'm leading or I just need to be in and listening to. And the expectations for me is not to have much of a contribution to that meeting, but that's a standing time block on my schedule that is a weekly thing that nobody thinks twice about. You know, and and kind of in that note of of that time where you spend with your family, whether that's, you know, during the workday or after hours, respect that time with your family too and allow yourself to fully check out. So a lot of software today has a do not disturb mode where you can turn it on and say after business hours, don't notify me. So I have this turned on for Outlook. I have this turned on for Microsoft Teams where after 5 p.m. I stop getting notified about work email. I stop getting notified about anything happening in Teams and I love it. I know on Android devices that have a work profile, you can turn the whole work profile off after hours as well. So take advantage of this. Use this technology because our brains are so wired for that hit of dopamine when you get that notification and you want to go look at it and respond to it right away. But if you don't know it's there, it really does help you check out and stay focused and in the moment with your family or with your friends or with anyone you want to spend your time with when you're not working. And kind of, again, piling onto that as well, email or messaging etiquette. Andy, you, you you talked about this a little bit before, but setting expectations with your team that I don't expect you to answer to email or answer messages when it's after hours or on weekends or whatever. And I've seen people even put things in their signature now where they'll say things like, my working hours may not align with yours. Do not feel obligated to respond outside of working hours. 
Now, me as, as again, somebody who's in sales, I'm always interested in, I want people to read my emails. If I email a customer, I want to make sure they see it. Delayed delivery is your friend with this as well. If you are banging out a bunch of emails on a weekend or after hours, don't send them at 8 p.m. at night because that's a really easy way for them to get buried and nobody to see them. Because if a whole bunch of automated emails come in overnight and it gets pushed down their inbox, they come in the next day, they might not see that email that came in 8 p.m. the night before. So use delayed delivery and don't deliver it until 8, 8 8.30, 9 a.m. the next day. And then you can make sure it hits their inbox right when they're sitting down to triage their email. That's a super easy feature to take advantage of in Outlook or in other email programs. So you can still do your email after hours, but you can make sure it doesn't go out until people are more likely to read it. And that's a way to be really conscientious of your team and your coworkers as well. I do the same thing where I turn on my do not disturb mode on my phone. It's a little bit later, but I also have these VIP contacts because if an incident does go off, I do want to have that notification. So I turn off notifications for everyone and you can set VIP contacts and have text or phone calls come through from certain people. So like my boss is listed as a VIP contact, my uh, direct coworkers are listed, my wife is listed. And so if there is an emergency and they contact me during the do not disturb, that message or that phone call still goes through. I also have an instant response pager, pager duty it's called, where that'll send out a message when a critical incident is created in service now. And so that number is also listed as a VIP contact. So I'll get that if there is a critical incident. So for the most part, notifications are turned off completely, but you know, because I'm in incident response, I have to have those critical ones still come through. Mm -hmm. Use the tools, man. That's, that's awesome. And, you know, kind of on that same vein, another thing I see people do more and more, and I love this is how to kind of differentiate who needs to do what on an email. So the most common strategy I see employed is if you are on the to line, I need something from you. I need you to respond. If you're on the CC line, I don't need anything from you. This is just informational. And so something people do at Microsoft, which is a famously email heavy culture, is they will actually set up filters or email rules, inbox rules, where if I'm on the to line, it goes in this folder. If I'm on the CC line, it goes in this folder. And that's a really easy way to triage emails to, and to understand, do I need to actively respond to this or is this just sent to me informationally? And that's another strategy to kind of deal with that is to help understand um, not only for emails you're receiving, but also emails you're sending, what your expectation is for people to do with it. You don't have to reply to every email. Definitely. And you know, set that expectation with your boss, set that expectation with your coworkers. When they send a message, you know, should I be responding after hours? Is this something that I need to? All of us, we work, you know, at different times because we're in information security. So my boss will often send me an email on the weekends or send me a message. But I know because we've talked about it, that his expectation is not for me to respond right then and there. If it is, he'll put that in the message. Hey, I need you to respond to this today because it is a critical incident. But if it's just some statement or he's asking a question or something like that, I know because we've talked about it, I don't have to respond to it. If I have time and I want to, I certainly can. And that's a personal decision if I want to take the time to do that. As well as when I send messages on the weekend or emails because I have a thought or I I wanted to write this down before I forget, I'll often begin with, you do not have to respond to me until your working hours. I'll put that right in the message, right in the beginning. You don't have to respond right now. Respond when you're you know next available. But here is, you know, my statement or whatever it is. So make sure that you are practicing empathy to people when you're sending those messages. If you are, and as Adam said, the delayed delivery is a great way for email. But if you're just sending like an instant message, if you don't need them to respond, put that in your message. And I think for security professionals, when alerts come through, you know, not everything is what I would consider like a code red. It's not something that has to be taken care of today. Not every request is an urgent request. So because there are so many things that we're doing, you have to be able to triage what's critical, what we have to do today, what is important right now versus what can be done tomorrow. There's always going to be more work. There's always going to be another alert. And so you have to be able to triage what's important right now that needs to get done today at this moment. And if it can wait, it's just going to fall by the wayside. And that is okay. You don't have to feel guilty about it because if you're to work 24 seven and not sleep at all, there still wouldn't be enough time to get done everything that needs to be done in the life of 
security professional. So if you're like me, you have to actually make a conscious effort to ignore things because I can be a little bit OCD and want to get everything done because I can't leave things undone. But I have had to learn that it's okay to leave things undone because there's just not enough time to do everything. That's great advice, Andy. And it's important to remember, and I've said this a couple of times on the show today, your company is getting more productivity out of you than ever. So it is okay to let things go to the next day. It's amazing how much we're all getting done in really less than ideal circumstances. And honestly, everyone listening to the show and working from home should feel really proud of what they've accomplished because you're doing something at most companies that they said wasn't possible. It wasn't possible to have people work from home and be productive. And that has been proven to be not true. And that's through the efforts of everyone working really, really hard in really suboptimal circumstances. So leave the work for the next day. Go spend time with the people who are matter to you. There will always be more work coming. So I think this was a great show, a great conversation. We hope you enjoyed it. That's our show for today. As always, there's a link in the show notes to our voicemail. Leave us a voice message or send us a DM on Twitter or LinkedIn if there's a security topic or something else that you want us to talk about or ask our opinion on. Thanks, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.